We have a fittingly important and uh, gracious speaker. Um, for some, he's an audio god. For some, he's the audio devil. For, other, he's, uh, for others, he's a prophet. But uh, Mohammed has come to the mountains. It's a great pleasure and an honor to introduce Harry Pearson. Thank you, guys. Uh, what I intend to do, guys, can you hear me, everybody? I'm going to cover a lot of points, past, present, and future. I'm not going to dwell on them. And when I get through covering them, I'm going to throw the floor open for questions. What I would like for you guys to do, and gals, is comment either, and even argue with each other, because we're at a critical moment right now. The old saying is that the seeds of the future are planted in the present. And we're planting seeds in the future now, and we've got to make the move. We can't just sit back and say, woe is me, which a lot of people, as you know, have been doing because the economic situation is not, well, the stimulus funds haven't gotten here yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm waiting. <laughs> okay, so in the past, when, we start, when I started the magazine, we had a lot of problems. One of them was uh, defining an audio language which, so we could all talk the same way and we could communicate with each other. And up until then, it hadn't been done. Gordon Holt did a lot of early work on definitions like transparency, et cetera, et cetera. Where I picked up the, uh, the baton, I guess, was talking about staging, depth, coherency, the things that we now listen for. We don't go back to early transistors with no depth and no sound stage, no speakers with fringes that kept you from a sound staging. Right now we have our problems now are not the problems then. Then we have problems of incoherency, of gross distortion, of early transistor distortion. Now we're having a hard time identifying different kinds of distortion. And we have to work a new language up now. The last thing I came up with was the concept of continuousness, which confused more people than me. Uh, <laughs> and now we're worrying about noise pollution. Well, just briefly, we also lost Wilma Cozart this past week, a week ago, Monday. And uh, what she always told me and she told everybody who worked with her was, trust your ears. You can trust the measurement, but not if it doesn't correlate with what you hear. And what are we talking about trusting your ears to? Music. The equipment's no fun unless it gets you to the music. And there are a lot of people who are just interested in equipment. But that defeats the purpose of what we're doing. What we're doing is trying to get close to the music. We're trying to open the music up for people, not chase them away. And right now, we've got that problem. Uh, about the time I came along, we also had the rise of the independent press, and that was Gordon Holt. Uh, he got sick and tired of high fidelity, <laughs> as so many others did, and started his first alternative publication. They called it Underground in those days. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was really funny being the underground publication. So I said, let's make it the alternative press because we're not the mainstream. We don't do what they do. Because the mainstream did, there, if you remember, is they measured everything. And they said it measures okay, so it must sound alike, and therefore there's no need for further discussion. We'll talk about the knobs and the dials and the build and this and that and the other. And nobody talked about the sound. So what we did was move to observational reviewing. Now, there are two parts to observational reviewing. One is describing what you hear, and that is, can be relatively objective. But then when you talk about how you feel about it, that's where you get into subjective. And one of the tendencies these days are people are talking only about how they feel, not necessarily what they observe. So we all have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We've got to be really critical about what we listen for. And to do that, we have to listen for the new distortions we're hearing. And most of these are caused, I think, by generated noise, like power line noise, or lack of isolation. Uh, there are things going on right now, as you know, like magnetic drive for turntables. You don't hear the record anymore. I, my liking it, it was to uh, say, you drive a car, and you don't hear the tires on the road. And what that does for disc is it opens up a whole base octave. So analog begins to have the disc quality of reputedly digital has. We also have 
of a bunch of battery-operated things. Now, that is one way of getting rid of induced noise right there. The problem with battery-operated things, as you know, is sometimes the dynamics suffer. Sometimes they don't. We also have uh, uh, a whole bunch of isolation devices that, that attack the problem. That can uh, some very interesting ones. Oh, Roy's not here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and then at the same time, going back to the past briefly, we had the rise of the super disk, which unfortunately I have to blame myself for. There was a big fire, as you may know, in my house in 1985. And I couldn't afford to replace my collection because I kept writing about all these super disks that you had to have in order to evaluate your system. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and I never knew that it would do that. I, know, you know, I didn't know that LPs were going to become a commodity. People come into my house and they see this whole wall of LPs and they look at it and they say, what is that? And I said, my IRA. <laughs> So we got to a point now where we really have eliminated most of the gross colorations, the, the incoherencies between drivers. We've gotten a new generation of crossovers that you can't hear most of the time. Think about it. You, the discontinuities are just not there. So the colorations that, say, we were use in the early days, like transparency and stuff, almost everybody has. We're, we're called upon now to do a higher level of audio criticism. And we really are. And that's one of the things that we're up against. Oh, yeah, we're helped along in this by a whole bunch of new capacitors and resistors. Uh, and the, from the Teflon on. I just got a Macintosh amplifier in that I was reviewing. And I talked to them. And they, their big thrill about going back to tubes was how much better the associated components were, the capacitors, the resistors that they didn't have before. And their stuff sounds better in tubes than it ever would have sounded. And so and they found out what audio research and everybody else knows, that we're living in an era where we have reduced significantly colorations, some that we didn't even know how to describe, from resistors and capacitors. So there we are. Um, I have talking points here, and I can read them, believe it or not. And one more thing, just talking about the past up to the present. When I had Eden Lumbly writing for the magazine back when, Everybody was making fun of her. And what was she concerned about? Induced power line noise. John Curl at the time said she was the most brilliant thing on that, thinker on that topic. That was 20, 25 years ago. She was that far ahead of her time. They were laughing at her saying, that woman's crazy. Well, yeah, she was sort of crazy. But she was right. That's what you go back to. Trust your ears. Don't make fun of somebody because they're different or they're crazy. Their judgment. Can they hear? And can they describe what they hear? And do they care about music? And if they don't care about music, don't listen to them. Don't. So uh, we said, we, I don't know what it, I know how to define continuousness, I think. It's when there's no break in the sound. Now, with early digital, you could hear the breaks in the sound. It turned out like grain. Whereas continuousness, Sally Reynolds once told me, my editor, that it was, continuousness was like a waterfall. You heard sheets of pure, uninterrupted music. You don't hear fragments. Even, no matter how fast they come together, you still hear it if it's not continuous. And one of the early things that transistors had to get over, and they're just now getting over, is that sense of they're getting a continuousness now. And it, it, it took a decade, a generation, 25 years, is a gen generation for them to get the technology down. And I've seen new technologies almost always take 25 years. Everything. I mean, the things that we're hearing now and playing with now, like, and I'll tell you one or two I'm going to talk about in a second, it takes a long time to develop and you have to have patience. Continuousness, we've got, we're getting, even if I don't know how to describe it to you. Uh, so, and part of what we're getting, getting, some of this is coming because we're getting high definition digital at long last and in a number of forms. I happen to think the DSD system is wonderful if you have a good playback system. But the fact of the matter is that Sony put out crap playback systems, and you had to go to people like Ed Meitner and others, DCS, to get the quality of continuousness in the playback system. So you could really hear what DSD could do. And of course, because of that, people also underrated the other key we have to the future, which is expanding the listening envelope. Now, we call that multi-channel. 
but don't make fun of multi-channel because it's just now the latest disc out on the market show the engineers are learning how to work it and they're learning how to make it effectively. I just heard John Adams' Transmigration of Souls, 9-11, and it's done in all the channels by Tart. And you hear the people walking around and things they're saying, and you hear the sirens, and you hear the music, and it is emotionally overwhelming, and you wouldn't get that. We have, a, we have an ability now to reproduce an acoustic space and do it naturally. The first, the first essay CDs were concentrating on having good sound, because they said, oh, we got DSD, we can have highs. But they weren't worried about the experience of, of, of multi-channel. And multi-channel is there to enhance realism by giving you an, a continuous envelope of sound. And this is one of the things we have to look for the future for. Ah, and there we have to talk about the computer generation. <laughs> There are a whole bunch of, of young, ardent audiophiles, a couple sitting here, who see the future, and it's coming through things like this, and through computers. And there's an audience out there, and I've said this before, but there's a huge audience out there, huge, millions, 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 millions. And I think, and I, <laughs> if we could get one, one and a half, two percent of that, we'd be fit for generations to come. We'd have the biggest audience we ever had. So the question now is, do we say, we don't want to get into that, we don't want that, blah, low resolution, blah, blah, blah. What we have to do is figure out how to achieve it and how to get them interested in what the potential of their system. Now, uh, one of the guys who used to work for me named Michael Mercer, who's right here, and you might ask him the question, came up with an idea that I thought worth mentioning to you guys. He says, that all audio stores ought to have computer stations so that the people can come in and plug their computer station into their computers or iPods or whatever into it and these things will be connected to different systems so they can hear what they're missing and hear how good something can be. Think about this because this is the way to seduce them, to lure them in to better music, to the very things that you're all here for. Yes? I think so. And. Uh, <clears throat> The high-end stores are sort of, they're so busy worrying about their video sales. And the video market really is like selling refrigerators. You might as well call it the Amana HD. It's a, you sell, you really, you sell it once, and that's a, you're pretty much finished unless Sony comes out with a new Blu-ray, the Super Blu-ray, or the Ultra Blu-ray, or the Blu-ray Imminent. But you know they do that. But they're trying to create the market that we have. We, our market is naturally, organically evolving. And if you think about it, you know it's true. It really is. But the, the, and the video stores, I think, are lose, have lost, going so heavy into video at the expense of audio, I think, is a big mistake. Because with they set up, you set up, you go to a good multi-channel setup, a good one, and it can be a, a relatively small, small set of speakers. You can be in for an experience now because the discs are beginning to catch up with the technology, the engineers. So. Uh, I think I said as a last point that it requires an expansion of our language. So if that's enough for you guys, from me for the moment, uh, what I will do is, uh, and you have, to, you have to speak up if you're way back there. Roy talks loud, I talk loud. Um, and you know that Roy Gregory was the editor of Hi-Fi Plus, which I persuaded the absolute sound to buy, and so then he quit. <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe you should let Mike Mercer say something. Mike came up with the idea of, the, and if you're interested, in the computer stations in the store. And he wrote a paper uh, that is published in, what's it, Negative Feedback? That's right. And he, he covers a lot of points. And Mike's opinions aren't going to agree with you or me on music and stuff, necessarily. But he sees the future. The guy working with me, Joey Weiss, sees the future. They're interested in music and lots of different kinds of music. And they see that we're losing out if we stick and say, we don't want them. We'll go on the same old way. We can't do that anymore. Go ahead. One final thing, quickly, um, just procedurally. Uh, when you ask a question or when you want to say something, please, if you'd like to stand up and speak very clearly so that the uh, people with the cameras get a chance to catch you. So, Mike, if you'd like to start. Um, wow, that was fun. 
Um, no, my, my idea centered around um, a hi-fi store that I was working at for a little while in Santa Rosa. And I'll try to summarize this, but the owner had been in business 30 years and didn't even want to talk about the iPod. Didn't want to know about the iPod, didn't want to talk about it. So what I did is I played a trick on him, an evil trick. Uh, we had just gotten a $7,000 Muse CD player in, so I brought my iPod in, had some uncompressed files, yes, they were uncompressed. I hooked it up, I put it behind the $7,000 Muse player, and I started playing it, and I brought him over. Mark, what do you think of this player? He sat down, he started ratting off about its dynamics, and clarity, and bass response, and all these wonderful things, and I went behind the rack, and I pulled out the iPod, and he said, <laughs> pardon my French, he said, you're shit. <laughs> said it's just a tool, and there are millions of people out there talking about music, sharing music, discovering new music. This is what hi-fi is about, right? So, okay, you're a dealer. Set up your good, better, best scenario. You have your good system, your better system, your best system, okay? You have your computers. affordable system, your right. less affordable system, That's right. and, your and your ultimate and your, and your system. non-affordable system. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to bring in that $200 iPods, but anyway. You know what? These kids, I know because I'm dealing with a lot of 20-year-old kids through the music blogs I write about, I write for, they do respond. I mean, now I've got these, these groups of kids talking to me about the USB DAX they just bought. They went to the flea market. One just bought a pair of AR3s for 40 bucks, and now he wants to get an integrated amplifier. I mean, the kids that are listening to this music, they respond to good sound. They really do. And it's up to the dealers to not say, Oh, you know, if someone walks in the store and they're 16 and they're wearing a Moby shirt, oh, no, you don't have the money. Because believe me, that happens. I'm sorry, it happens. And you know what? If we want to continue and just move forward and not just sustain, I think we got to treat those kids and, you know, the 20s and 30-year-olds with some respect, the, the respect they deserve, and they will earn all of you money. Imagine that. More money for everybody. Okay, sit down. I know. Okay, questions, anybody? Who, first? Nobody has a question? Mr. Sircom. Oh, this is the new publisher of Hi-Fi Plus, Alan Sircom. I call him Alan Sitcom. Okay, uh, moving on from what my friend there has just said. Uh, let's have a little show of hands. I wonder how many of you have got an iPhone? Yeah. Right, okay. Now, of those of you who have got an iPhone, when the last time you went to a dealer, and I don't want to turn this into a dealer bashing scenario, but when the last time you went to a dealer, did they turn around and say, oh yeah, plug that into a dock? Or did they just ignore it? How many, how many have actually played their iPhone through a dock? Okay. What? Well, 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 well done. Two. I have a question. Did, are you moving into iPhones, not iPod Touches? Other well, no, 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 no. I mean, yeah. it could be an iPod or I went, to that, I went to that same dealer, yeah. Santa Rosa, and he was absolutely happy to play my I, uh, oh. I, iPod through his system. Yeah. In fact, I brought in a, 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 a laptop and played it through an MP5 that he yeah, had. Yeah, now he is. That's the point. Yeah. yeah. Now, now he owns an iPod. My, <laughs> only, my only suggestion about the iPhone is that you might walk into the dealers, pick up the phone and go, oh, chat, chat. You know, but remember that we're talking about the iPod as one delivery system. Yeah. We have an infinite number of delivery systems. We've seen some here if you go around. There are stationary players that have no moving parts. They can download 196 and 24 real bits. There is all, the developments are right here at this show all over the place if you go look. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. That was, that was all. I, just, it, I, I don't want this to sound like a dealer bashing me because it isn't. But I think we need to, as an industry, we need to kind of wake up to the fact that people walk in with a phone that might carry all their music or a significant portion of their music and we've never put the two and two together to say, hey, listen to this. Take that phone, plug it in a dock, and they go, wow, I, I can't believe you could do that. It's just one of the things I think we're, we're kind of missing out. Anyway, that's it. I'll sit down. Yep. I have something to ask everybody. Most of you people here aren't dealers. Most of you people are audiophiles. Have you ever walked into a store and the way you were sold to was you were talked down to? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't been to Lyric, have you? And, 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 you want to know the truth? You know, you started talking about it. You started talking about it with young people. But it's not just young people, it's all audio dealers. I owned an audio store for a bit, and the guy that Did I was... Did you do it too? No. And the guy, the guy that I was partners with, 
you know, he would literally get people to hear something that didn't exist, and mm. that's when he knew he could sell them whatever he wanted. Mm. And I think that audio dealers need to start giving people, you know, credit for intelligence, credit for ears, and saying, well, would you like this, or would you like this? Give them some respect. Well, how do we do, how do we think about a dealer education program? One of the things that he, Mike suggested is one step in that direction. Is there, do we have a seminar next year here to educate dealers? And what psychiatrist is going to put it together? <laughs> well, Freud is dead. <laughs> <laughs> For how much? <laughs> Question, come on, somebody. Go ahead, Bob. Well, I, I just am wondering, to your point, I think there's another issue here. And that's the medium. Uh, let's face it, MP3 is the most popular medium in the audience that you're talking about. Uh, and it's it's by far the crummiest. But hold on. Because MP3, as a term, to be honest, if you're talking about, you know, sites like the Daily Swarm or Blast FM or Spotify, you know, that are streaming, it's not MP3. It's higher res. MP3, as a format itself, you're right, is terrible. but like I said, I'm fortunate now. I live in California. I have a lot of young friends. I meet a lot of young people. And maybe at two out of ten that I meet are fine with an MP3. They're not. If it's their only choice, like me, I'm a music addict. If the only way I can get a certain piece of music is an MP3, I'll get it. But they always choose better. Meaning, like, they're always going to go 256 on iTunes Plus. They're never going to go, you know. So I, well, I don't think that's true. That's still how good is 256 plus? I mean, but you know what? That's a again, starting point. It's a low-end it, medium. It's just a building block, is what I'm saying. Well, you, I, under, you I could, understand that, but some of the selling stuff that goes on with these type of players and everything. Look, I can cram 10,000 songs on my iPod or whatever. It, some of that's the marketing that's geared toward these people. And of course, they get saturated. Hey, with it. Right. Sorry, we've got a, we've got a couple of people oh, who wish to respond. So. Yeah. Not a response. I'd like to, I could, if we look to the past instead of the future, I'd like to hear, as you look back over many years, what components bring to you uh, the greatest sense of joy and pleasure, remembrance, fondness, affection? Would you list a few and, and why they're so important to you in your 20 years or so? Do you want me to name specific components? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. The components I loved were the ones that I could live with the longest period of time. Not the longest loan, but the ones that did the most music. I, early days of audio research, the 150 was one of the, I thought one of the best things ever done. The uh, SP6, um, the old first coet suits, the first moving coil cartridges that really sounded like music and not, you know, shrill peak, et cetera, et cetera. There were obviously the, the records. We know about the Mercury's, uh, but the, with the whole record business and playing them back and improving turntables. Did I ever like a turntable? Did I? No. No. I don't think so. I really don't. Uh, I really do like the clear audio today, but, but that's because it, I like components that let me hear the future too. I mean, it's got, it can't be just good. It has to be state of the art in the sense that it advances the art. And the best components have advanced the art. Uh, what else did I like? You know, I didn't expect that question. Uh, what else did I like? Did I? No, 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 no. no. Um, <laughs> speakers. Oh well. The IRS was I th the the breakthrough. Well, actually, my combining the uh, tweeter strips with the Maggies was really one of the great breakthroughs because then I discovered soundstage because I didn't have the diffraction effects. And it, made, and it did what Mercury said they did, a soundscape. You could hear it across the room, violins here, bass there, woods in the room. And I was thrilled because it allowed me to develop my language. It allowed me to start talking about depth, which transistors didn't have at that point. It allowed me to talk about stage width. And I kept getting these loony letters from this guy in, in the Orient saying, how can you hear width? It can't go beyond the microphone. I said, microphones here like this. Then you go like that. You know, you reproduce it right, you will get sage width. Uh, I never really was crazy about electrostatics because 
No electrostatic seemed to me. What they did was solve some of the problems of early speakers, lack of coherency. But there was no place they could go. It seemed like the only way you could make electrostatic great is to make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it had a sort of a skeletal sound. You know, you were listening to an x-ray of the music. And I, had a, I learned something from a, an interview I did with Mike Kay. He said, if you listen on headphones all the time, you don't really hear music. Because to really hear music, you have to feel it. And that's why going to the concert hall is such a great thing, because you feel the pressure on your skin. Now, that is one of the great breakthrough insights for me. Because if I can't hear the, the, the waves of sound, and I don't get that feeling of that sound, then I don't think more with speakers. Gee, a lot. So I was trying to stay away from today's speakers. But the IRS was classic. The, even the Audio Research D600 was classic. I like some of the early Conrad Johnson stuff a great deal because they had promise, and, which they're realizing. You want to know more? Can I make one point? What? Not many of you, obviously, will have had the pleasure of visiting Seacliff, but those who have will know that actually listening to the big system at Seacliff is literally a visceral, physical experience in a way that makes absolute sense of what Harry's just said, and in a way that I don't think any of the systems here are even like to get close to. And the one thing that the, the big systems at Seacliff do is they do scale in a way that I've not heard from other systems anywhere else. So. What is Seacliff? Sorry, Seacliff is where Harry lives. <laughs> <laughs> I've asked myself that question for years. <laughs> there are many answers. <laughs> and not many of them are polite. Well, Seacliff is a little fishing village on the shores of Hempstead Harbor on Long Island Sound. And it's uh, an old Victorian village in a lot of places. I live in an 1886 house, which is very fortunate because I have high ceilings, plaster walls, wood floors, and a good acoustics. It was a good acoustic lab. I moved in when I went to work for Newsday as the environmental writer. I had no idea I moved into a sonic potential. I was just an audio freak then. Sir, I'll get to you right next, okay? Go ahead. I wanted to comment on Years ago, to know what stereo stores were selling. But it seems to me that today, we talk to people are complaining about dealers. They expect the same dealer to sell a Ferrari and a Honda, or to sell a Saks Fifth Avenue custom made suit and something off the rack. But the concept of a dealer doesn't make sense. I mean, of course, people who sell you know, a $30,000 cable is not going to have time for someone walking in with the mobile t shirt. So, and he shouldn't have it, right? But it doesn't because he's trying to make a big elephant type sale. So, I have an issue with. The problem they would meet with the audio, high audio industry is that are we talking about 500 systems or 50,000 dollar systems? You can't expect the same dealer to have the knowledge or the interest or the, or the client relation the manners to deal with something that's about 100 grand versus 5 grand. It's not the same industry anymore. And, and I have a real problem with the fact that people are trying to lump together. Are you asking a question or making a statement? My question is that people are complaining about dealers and how can you compare a Ferrari dealer with a Honda dealer? And expect that they're not the same as different companies. Well, this has always been a problem, and generally what happens, at least in areas, big city areas, is you have dealers who tend to specialize. But if you have an average dealer, I don't think you're going to have a dealer who does it all. But how many dealers actually have room for an $80,000 system or great big speakers? Most of them don't. So you have to sort of take it on faith. Let's say you take a speaker like, uh, like Carl Marchesota's outlines. If you listen to a little one, and you know who the rest of his speakers, they all have the same basic quality. They just get bigger and move more air and move more air. So if you like the sound, you can maybe assume you can move up. There are assumptions you can make as an intelligent listener. If it sounds like this at low levels, don't go any further. And a good dealer will always pick out speakers and amps that sound like music. And that, to some extent, will protect him against those matters of scale that you're talking about, I think. Now, you, I saw you were next, OK? Yeah, actually, uh, Sorry, could you uh, stand for us? Sorry. Sure. Uh, first comment, um, <coughs> to, your, to your point about the musicality of uh, today's audio systems, I mean, I've heard some incredibly expensive out-of-this-world systems today. And I have the good fortune of living in New York City and having access to some of the greatest musical venues in the world. Yep, yep. And what I'm hearing from these amazing systems 
is not what I'm hearing in the music. In the music well, world. that is, but believe me, that is not necessarily universally true. A lot of expensive systems don't sound like music. They sound like hi-fi or high definition. They don't sound like music, and you've got to be able to make the distinction between something that tickles your timbers, <laughs> don't say it, <laughs> and something that really gets you a sense, you stop listening to the speaker or what, and you listen through to the music. Now, you go to Carnegie Hall, you know that there are plenty of things. I go, and I, when I go, I close, I close my eyes and try to pretend I'm listening to a stereo system to see what we're not doing. And that's one of the ways I keep progress in front of me, because I go, I, I see we're not getting there. But I see where we have to work. I'm sorry, but back. Did you have to pay? No, actually, there was, there was one, one other point. Um, recently, I received a gift. It was a box set of CD-ROMs with every issue of Rolling Stone magazine from its very first issue. And one of the things that I observed is that there was a time, at least, probably the 70s, when audio equipment was advertised to non-audiophiles. And, and, and it seems to me like we've got audiophiles talking to audiophiles and we're not really doing enough. Well, I think that was part of Michael's point and that was part of mine. We're not yeah. reaching out. We've gotten into a state of stasis and we're not reaching out to the audience. You should advertise in Rolling Stone and, and not just because you're Bose and have the money. You should be able to take ads out where people can read them. Like, Sorry, can I, on that point, it's all very well reaching out to people but you better make damn sure that when they respond, you've got something to show them. And too often, at the moment, this industry doesn't actually deliver, in my opinion. Sorry, next question. Yes, um, I, have, Sorry. Um, I have a personal observation. About 40 years ago, I was raised in Albuquerque and went to a, a, the high-end uh, audio place called uh, the Hi-Fi House. And when you went there, I realized, my friend and I, that we, we were going to be waited on. So we went home and we put on our Sunday best, and then we got waited on. And, but the, once we got in the door, the, the man had a very keen sense as to where our potential was, and guided us there, and matched things to, as you said, find something that was going to fit us and, and play the real music. I, I still remember hearing the things we couldn't touch, the original home and, and uh, some of the early ESS some other things back there in the early 70s. But, but it was an experience that, that really latched onto me. At that time, it was Life Magazine, and you would flip through Life, and you'd see the high-end grants and other things that were trying to get you know, out to the populace. So there, there was that time. You want to answer it? No, I was going to let you. No, I don't want to answer they, it. They, they came here to he hear said, you, he said, he said everything that, you know, we're in accord. Yeah, absolutely. No answer required. Sorry, next question. Oh, come on, somebody. Uh, would you comment on uh, the, the viability and future of high-end esoteric salons in the age of the Internet? I think they're dead. I really do think they're dead. I think that what's happening is Sorry. we're going to become... What? Sorry. Repeat the question. He wanted to know if high-end esoteric salons would survive in the future. And I said, no, I think they're dead. I think you're seeing a process of democratization. Thank you, got to get that out. Democra democratization, yeah, of the field. And that's what you want. What's the idea of having music equipment if you don't have it for the people? You've got to have music for the people. And I don't, I don't mean to sound like Obama there. I, you really do. You, <laughs> I, I, was, I was born in Hawaii. Okay. <laughs> but I'm serious about this. I think that there may be an occasional... I think the esoteric sales will go to private individuals. I think you'll have what we used to have. We used to have people working at home. One of our reviewers, Paul Cedor, used to sell just some esoteric stuff in his house. I think that's where you'll see it go, and I think you'll see the dealers appealing to a broad audience. And that doesn't mean crapping out, because the equipment's going to get better. And you will know it's going to get better because if you listen to it, something really complicated, you'll hear more information, and that will create more of an, you know, a music, a more of an effect. Okay. I think one of the biggest barriers to people getting into this hobby is. Uh, Sorry, could you start again and speak a little louder? Okay, sure. I think one of the biggest uh, barriers to uh, people starting in this industry, in this hobby. <laughs> 
is the production of the music that's going on today. For example, uh, people getting into vinyl in particular. Uh, when you look at the issues that come out, even from major labels, Universal, you know, get back, you, you still never know. A lot of times you can't even get the information. Was this sourced from a, a, a CD, PCM digital track? Who mastered it? You know, oh, exotic, you know, releases from Japan that cost a lot of money. But who did it? And are they any good? And the only way to find out is to spend 50 bucks and maybe you'll get burned. And I think this is a really bad experience for a lot of people. In your opinion, what do you think, moving forward, we can do to address this problem of... Use Google. I'm serious. You can find out a lot about how every recording is done, who processes it, what kind of vinyl they're using. And you can find it out by talking to the people who know. Yeah, AllMusic.com. Yep. Yeah. Say it well. AllMusic.com, a great source. Artists, uh, producers like Frank Filippetti, Phil Ramon, all of them. You can get information on who's mastering, who's recording, where they're recording, all that kind of stuff. There are these com there are these conversations going on, and you can yeah. pick up a lot of information, and you know what's crap, and you know what's good. You can find out about the different CD pressing plants, and what some mm -hmm. aren't. Music. You have trouble identifying yeah, some of it. Yeah, I do, I do have a use of one, so I use them extensively. But the point is, a lot of times the reviews come from people that may not, you know, that may be more interested in putting and seeing their name on a post than actually, you know, they may not have developed systems themselves. You know, sometimes you get, you can get completely turned around on which is the best pressing stuff. Like, it's very, very difficult. And the internet was ever so. Well, exactly. Yeah, it is that well, way. I yeah, think what he's saying is there's no. Sorry, you need to stand, you need to stand sir, and talk, and talk to the audience, not to I, me. I'm I here. think what you're saying is there's no standardization in the industry. There's no like label like to yeah. put in the corner of the album that says, you know, this is from whatever analog or digital yeah. or whatever. And I think what you're saying is important in that, you know, the beginner who's getting into this. You know, doesn't want to go to Google and do yeah. hours of research. They just want to know, you know, yeah. where did this come from? Is, does, is it good? And they need to make these decisions in a quick yeah. and yeah, reliable a yeah. source. Yeah, because what we're saying is, yes, for us, for us, we <coughs> to believe in But I, I, I want to make a point. When I started the magazine, you never knew who produced, recorded, or engineered it until you read Mercury's labels. And Mercury's labels influenced the whole business. So now you, cannot, you find out where it's recorded, you find out what equipment's used, you find out when it was done, you find out what DSD was, technique was used. We're getting more and more open and, what's the word we're using, transparent? Yes, we're more and more transparent about this. You're pointing out something that is solving itself in a way because of the increasing intelligence of the average listener and buyer. We really are. No, well, you know, what I'm saying is I'm talking about the barrier to getting into it. And this really affects the vinyl world particularly, right? Because there's a lot of very excellent high-end makers involved in the production of this gear. And before somebody gets into it, like you, you're talking about the, the deep digging that you can do to find out. And some, in some cases, you have to dig quite deep to find out what's going on when it's coming from a foreign country. So you talk, it's very difficult. and I'm willing to do that, but the person, what we're talking about is barriers to getting in. We're talking about the person who tries an LP based on one of these recordings, gets burned, and says, records suck. Well, that's going to happen, that's gonna, yeah. and that's the price you pay. I mean, there's nothing's going to solve that problem except a more educated, more intelligent, more questioning listener. Another question, somebody. Anybody? Yes. Yep. Dr. Norber, Edge, Edge Electronics. Um, you know, I, I look around and I'm, I see mostly men. Louder. I look around and I see mostly men. Why? Um, <laughs> you think? White men, yes, yes. Some possibly born in Hawaii, and some carrying knees now. A lot of them carrying knees. Look at that. I got it. Can you believe that? Um, yeah. Arp. 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 It doesn't mean. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't mean that that as we age, and as I know, and as we suffer certain loss of hearing, <laughs> that we don't appreciate music. I'll tell you something about that. Three of the best designers I ever knew 
were designing musical sounding instruments into their 70s and early 80s. Saul Morantz, Bill Johnson, and a couple more. And you know how they did it? They listened to live music. They didn't turn the system up to compensate for their hearing loss. They tried to set the system according to what they were hearing in the concert hall, and that allowed them to create a correct high end and a correct mid range because if the high end is wrong, you will hear it in the mid range if you know what to listen for. And, that's a, it's, and it, it amazed me that the ear can go on, but what you have to do is you have to love music and you have to go out and you have to listen to it. So you can extend the lifespan of your ear. Of course, if you put these headphones in there like that and blast away, you're going to kill your hearing before us because the Major hearing loss is between 4 and 8 kilohertz. That's where the hearing range is most sensitive. That's where women hear better than men. And that's why women say, it's distorted, turn it down. We've never made a serious attempt. I think my magazine was the first one to ever hire women. Because women are 50% of our audience, and they can hear better, and they can teach us. And do we learn from them? Yes. Ask the lady. You haven't said anything. Come on, say something. Question. You have a comment? I, I, I agree with you. And how many systems do you hear in this in this gathering that are just very very bright that irritate you to all ends? And I and I crunch up yeah. my face uh -huh. and, and I I want to leave the room. Uh -huh. um, like a lot of them. And this is shamefully the sadly, there's quite a few that have chased down. Okay, guys, we're going to take three more questions. Okay, we're going to take three. Okay, we're going to take three. Time out. We're going to take three more questions, uh, and I would like to, two of them be from virgins. Question virgins. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> uh, in the uh, mid '70s, I went and lived in Japan for a number of years and got introduced to the single and the trio horn. I guess you could call it a cult at that time. And then when I came back to the U.S. many years later, I found that it had started to develop here in the, in the United States. And I was wondering what's your well, thinking on that? Oh. It started out before stereo. It was big horns, efficiently, and single-ended triodes. It was stereo and the need for two speakers that reduced the size and the amplifier power had to go up and the problem started. We just recently started moving back to the virtue of the wide dynamic range you get from horns. Now, I personally have heard very few single-ended triads that I thought were uncolored enough for use. Uh, the, the sapphire, who's, we have it, what's the, Y Tech sapphire. That is very clean, but you can't use it on everything, obviously. So it's, you, if you like the sound, but you like a speaker that's not that efficient, and Generally speaking these days, the horns still have some of the problems the horns have. You know, discontinuity, brightness, blah, blah. They're, I think they're much more difficult to set up. I like them because you get a wide dynamic range, which you can get in the hall. And when, we've talked about dynamic range not enough today because there are lots of dynamics that have to be done, nuances to mac macro to macro, and I talk about it all the time. And the realism of music is in those subtle transitions between, say, very soft and soft. That's when you start to think it's real. Uh, we got two more questions. Sir. What's your projection of the biggest change over the next 10 years? What? What's going to change, and what, what do you think is the biggest thing that will change in this industry over the next 10 years? I thought I said that. <laughs> Didn't I? Did I not answer that question, really? I, I think I talked about the democratization. I talked about bringing the new generation in. I talked about reduction of noise. But I don't know which. I think they're all happening. And it's very difficult to tell you exactly what order and, and of what, sorry, Harry, of what importance is going to happen. You don't know. I don't. If you ask me what I thought right now, I was surprised that uh, more people aren't using magnetic drive on the turntables. I'm surprised that there's not more work on battery operated stuff. But I found some stuff here that I'd like to listen to. Uh, the, the work on cables and the work on noise systems are advancing so much so that I think we're in for, I think we, what we're going to do, okay, in my opinion, what we're going to do is we're going to refine ourselves into much better sound 
And I don't see any great major breakthroughs except maybe in the, the multi-channel creation of an envelope. What we're going to do is we're going to get rid of even more crap. We are. And there's going to be less between you and the music. Everything will sound more continuous as it does when you hear it. Right here, you're hearing me continuously. You do not hear my voice broken up into little bits digitally. And this is, what, this is the real sound. This is the absolute sound. Now, you're getting it. Go to a concert hall, that's it. You don't have an absolute beef bourguignon. You don't have an absolute sh champagne. Those are matters of taste. But you do have an absolute sound, and you can go to concerts, and you should. You must go to music, and then you know. And remember what Wilma said. Trust your ears. One more question? Last one. Last Any one? takers? Would you be able to comment on the hi-fi scene, the hi-fi dealerships in other countries? I know we hear about the UK, Germany, Japan. All the things that we've been hearing here tonight, is it typical of those uh, dealerships in both areas? Well, I don't know. You know, I can't get a passport to go out of the country. I can't give a birth certificate. <laughs> I was born in Hawaii. I forgot. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> but the death panel's coming to get me if I keep on talking, so I'm just kidding around, okay? The, the answer to your question is essentially yes. <coughs> it, it differs he, he in detail. Britain. Alan oh, over there, CIRCOM is ready to leave. He's there. <laughs> well, he and Roy can talk about Britain and the continent, and they can talk with some authority about it. I've just never shopped over there. Okay. The question was, do the, do the same observations that have been made about dealers in this country apply across international markets? And why you can't get a birth certificate? And the <laughs> other guy doesn't have a problem. What's up? <laughs> the other guy from Hawaii. Well, uh, Hawaii didn't used to be a state, if you go back far enough. <laughs> and on that happy note, we'll draw this to a close. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, guys. Hey, you stood up, hey, that's great.